All right, chapter 29. Chapter 29 is chest and abdominal trauma. So as we continue to uh, study our patients that have become injured, uh, we move to the chest and abdominal uh, areas of the body or the trunk of the body essentially. Um, what we have to keep in mind here is the chest and abdomen uh, are some of the, uh, the biggest danger zones for hidden trauma and uh, hidden life threats. So because of the large nature of the cavities, there's the potential for there to be ticking time bombs in there that we don't necessarily uh, see immediately. Of course, we have our objectives on uh, 679 uh, in the textbook. Not too many objectives, a relatively short chapter. couple multimedia videos on pneumo and hemothorax, which are some of those uh, hidden killers uh, or potential hidden killers, as well as liver injury video. And our core concepts to cover are understanding chest injuries and emergency care for such, and the same thing for abdominal injuries and their associated emergency care. So to start with chest injuries, we have uh, a number of things that obviously can occur. Blunt trauma, uh, blunt trauma, say from a ball bat, a fall, uh, on a, you know, on whatever, an assault, uh, a car crash. We can uh, fracture ribs. Obviously, fracturing ribs uh, impedes breathing, um, as does the sternum, uh, and then the costal cartilages or the rib cartilage. That's what connects those ribs to the sternum. So this blunt trauma affects that vacuum system in there, not to mention can pop lungs and can create uh, hidden bleeds. We have some compression injuries, or uh, this occurs when severe blunt trauma causes the chest to rapidly compress. So uh, this is a, a case in which we may see a paper bag style injury where all of a sudden you slam your hand into this uh, paper bag that you're holding shut and it pops really loud. And it'll be the same sort of thing that uh, occurs with the chest. If you've got a big breath full of air, or a bit, your chest is full of a, a big breath of air, and uh, you slam into the steering wheel, you can have that same effect and create a, a collapsed lung. Obviously, penetrating injuries. So um, bullets, knives, pieces of, of metal, steel rods, pipes, other things. This uh, can damage internal organs and impair respiration, obviously, because it's going to also affect the vacuum. Things that go through and through, straight through, um, tend to be a little bit easier to detect the possibilities. But when we talk about small pieces of shrapnel, bullets, and whatnot that actually bounce around or tumble, um, it's very difficult to say for sure where they went. You know, if, if a straight metal rod goes through your chest, you can pretty much predict what was in its path. But if you have a bullet that goes in, say, through um, you know, your back below your shoulder blade and it comes out um, your abdomen or it comes out you know, your left side, you very possibly bounced around and shredded a bunch of stuff on the way. So it's much more difficult to figure out what may have happened there. So when we have closed chest injuries, we have a couple of things we have to be con considering. We'll introduce a couple of terms here, the flail chest and paradoxical motion. The flail chest is a section of ribs, and it's generally classified as two or more consecutive ribs broken in two or more places. So two ribs next to each other, each one of them broken twice, so making a section of rib broken away and that it creates the flail segment. So we could have you know ribs three and four, five and six, three, four, five, six, whatever, all in that same general vicinity. And they show a, a good example here uh, in the picture. What happens with flail segments is we will see these via their paradoxical motion. Um, they're not exclusively the same thing, but um, a flail segment in most cases does have paradoxical motion, but other things could potentially have paradoxical motion as well. So the paradoxical motion means it, it goes counterintuitive to what we believe it should. 
So if you stop for a moment, I want you to put your chin to your chest, watch your chest as you inhale, take a big breath. You see your chest go upward and outward. That's the normal path that the chest would travel. With paradoxical motion, most of your chest would go, when you inhale, go upward and outward, but the flail segment would suck inward and downward. And then when you exhale, if you watch your chest when you exhale, it goes inward and downward. The paradoxical motion of the flail segment would cause that portion of ribs to actually bulge outward and upward potentially. Uh, and that's the, that is paradoxical motion. It goes against the grain essentially. So to assess a flail segment, um, we first of all need to look at what the mechanism of injury was. Is there a direct blow, and in most cases this is a blunt trauma, direct blow to the chest that would potentially cause there to be fractured ribs. The patient will, will probably also be complaining of difficulty breathing, may show some, some signs of hypoxia, may have some tachypnea or maybe you're slightly uh, um, cyanotic. They're probably also complaining of pain because this will be very painful. Anybody who's broken a rib or had pleurisy or pleuritis can, can attest to the fact that every time you take a breath, you move that rib, and that rib hurts every time it moves because it can't fully heal because you can't really immobilize it. Uh, and then chest wall muscle contraction. So they may have uh, really trying to keep their chest from moving much because of that pain. So something called guarding. They may try to have very, very shallow breaths so they do not have um, this increased pain on every respiration. Our treatment for flail segment, primary assessment for life threats, administering O2. We're going to monitor the patient's respiratory rate and depth, and we are assisting ventilations if they're too shallow. If we can talk the patient into taking bigger breaths, even though it hurts, that will suffice. However, if they just can't do it, we have to ventilate for them. Uh, positive pressure ventilation may reduce the movement of the flail segment because we disrupt the dynamics of how our normal respiration works because normally we suck air in because we have a negative pressure in our chest. As opposed to with positive pressure ventilation, we're pushing it in so we're increasing the pressure. So it should push in the same direction as the inhalation in the same direction with the exhalation. So that being said, sometimes the patient does a fine job themselves of breathing and taking good deep breaths. It was not a bad idea to hand them a pillow to hug um, and let them hold that pillow close to their chest. That helps kind of blunt that paradoxical motion, paradoxical motion to an extent. We used to say put a lot of bulky dressings, and we tried to tie it on there kind of tight to keep them from from moving. And we tried sandbags on them for a while, and nothing really worked very well. So really, the, the thing is is maintaining good ventilations, and then if necessary, and they can handle it, you you let, give them a a pillow to hug, and that helps them kind of blunt that uh, paradoxical motion. Open chest injuries, on the other hand, very difficult to tell what is injured from the entrance wound. Now, we're going to have to assume that all wounds are life-threatening. You've got to assume if it's gone through the chest that it's either affected a lung or both lungs, the heart, or the greater vessels, uh, and potentially even the spine. So. Really, there, there's, there's nothing good about having an open injury to your chest. Uh, assume that all those are life-threatening, and then open wounds allow air into the chest, and this is this throws off the balance of pressure, and it causes the lung to collapse. So this causes something called a pneumothorax, um, and a pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. There are different types of pneumothorax. The one that they show here called the sucking chest wound um, is an open pneumothorax 
um, and at this point is an open simple pneumothorax. You can have something called a tension pneumothorax that makes things a little worse. And you can have a closed pneumothorax where it actually, the lung deflates on the inside uh, and it doesn't, uh, there's no hole in the out, outer wall. The reason that a pneumothorax occurs is because the two linings within the chest there, the parietal and visceral pleura, which are supposed to kind of stick together due to a little bit of moisture in between them, get separated. And when they get separated, air gets in there, that air um, disrupts that surface tension basically and causes that lung to kind of uh, come away from the wall. When it comes away from the wall, it doesn't have the structure, doesn't have the, um, it doesn't have any bones or anything to support it, so it just kind of withers. So through a direct entrance wound to the chest, we get this open chest, uh, sucking chest wound. Uh, there may or may not actually be the sucking sound. You may see some bubbles in the blood, and they may be gasping for air. They're going to have a tough time catching their breath with this. So in order to treat an open chest wound, um, any open chest wound, we should probably consider putting some sort of an occlusive dressing on it. And I mentioned this in the bleeding wounds and shock chapter. But what we're doing here, I'm not, number one, we've got to maintain an airway and breathing for this person. But we also need to close off that opening to the outside world. So to seal that wound, we use the occlusive dressing. Whether or not we actually choose to use the Vaseline gauze, it's really not that important. We just need something that can keep air from entering the chest. And they've taped it down here on all but one little corner. That is uh, uh, probably the best way to do it. Some places they say just tape it on three sides to so leave one entire side open because when they inhale it will suck up close to the chest and it won't allow air in. Um, you've got all kinds of materials on your truck that you can do this with. Heck, maybe you take the occlusive dressing and uh, don't even use the gauze with the Vaseline in it. You just tape the foil over their, their chest. I would recommend putting something between the foil and the chest like a standard 4x4 gauze, um, but using this as a seal or a valve. If you accidentally tape it down on all four sides, not thinking, um, and they start to develop increased difficulty breathing, heart rates are skyrocketing, respiratory rates are skyrocketing, blood pressures are tanking, you may have developed what's called a tension pneumothorax, meaning that because the air could not escape, it actually is building up pressure and pushing on the other lung. And if that's the case, then you need to let loose one side of your occlusive dressing. Uh, and by doing that, it allows that built up tension or air to escape. Uh, administering oxygen, we need to kind of stack the deck for these people because they have obviously at least one lung that can't function at a normal capacity. So. Um, Administering oxygen is going to be critical. Treat them for shock. A lot of these people, if they would become uh, tension pneumothorax, they are going to look shocking. So they're going to be tachycardic, uh, tachypneic, pale, cool, clammy, nauseated. So prepare for immediate transport and consider ALS. Certain types of closed, injury, closed chest injuries also develop these, what we call closed pneumothorax. Um, and if it develops a tension pneumothorax, a paramedic can stick a needle through the patient's chest wall and let that air escape. So think about it. Does a patient's chest injury need to be treated during the primary assessment? Yes, it does. Uh, the patient's chest injury almost always has some effect on either breathing or circulation, if not both. Does an open chest injury require an occlusive dressing? Yes, it does. They may not have the signs or symptoms of a pneumothorax, however, they maybe just haven't developed a, a significant one yet. So it would be a good idea to put an occlusive dressing on a chest injury. And does the patient's injury necessitate immediate transport to a trauma center? Again, something you're going to have to consider based off of the patient. So injuries to the chest, we've got pneumothorax, hemothorax, and hemoneumo or pneumohemo thorax. So we have either air taking the space of the lung, blood taking the space of the lung, 
or air and blood taking the space of the lung. Um, and you can get these. There's lots of blood vessels in the, in the chest. And remember, every rib has an artery, a vein, and a nerve on the underside of it. So getting a good break in a rib very possibly could cause you to bleed into the chest. So, And again, they're showing another occlusive dressing here. This one they've taped only on three sides. Uh, traumatic asphyxia. This is a sudden compression of the chest, forcing blood out of the organs and rupturing blood vessels. Typically, the neck and face are darker in color than the rest of the body. They can have bulging eyes, which is called exophthalmos, interesting medical term, exophthalmos, distended neck veins, broken blood vessels in their face. So a lot of times their face will be bright red. And if you look at the picture on 686 in your text, you can see um, the traumatic asphyxia in this guy's face, basically above his chin. You can almost see a, what we refer to as a line of demarcation, meaning where you see the difference between normal uh, and abnormal. Um, this is usually from a large blunt force trauma, somebody trapped between a, a car and a building or a car and a tree or a tree falls on somebody. That's typically the thing you see uh, with those are typically the types of injuries that may cause traumatic asphyxia. A significant number of patients who suffer at traumatic asphyxia die. Cardiac tamponade, or also known as pericardial tamponade. This is a direct injury to the heart causing blood to flow into the pericardial sac around the heart. The pericardium is a tough sac that rarely leaks and it does not have good give. And the increased pressure on the heart so uh, it doesn't allow the chambers to fully fill. Remember that the blood vessels that feed the heart are on the outside of the muscle. And around the entire muscle, blood vessels, all the actual real heart itself is the pericardial sac, which is intended to be a protective layer, more or less a, a bulletproof vest around your heart. And But it is a completely closed system. So if the heart is uh, leaking blood on the outside or building up pus between the heart and the pericardial sac, the pericardial sac does not give well. The heart readily moves, so every Every time the heart beats, it may pump out more blood into the sac, which then in turn puts more pressure on the heart. The pericardial sac stretches so minimally that it doesn't take long at all, and that pressure is being pushed inward on the heart muscle itself. This causes blood, blood to back up into the veins because the heart can't pump efficiently. Uh, it's kind of like a heart failure system. Uh, usually results from a penetrating trauma. Uh, a stab wound or a gunshot wound, uh, distended neck veins, shock, and a narrowed pulse pressure. So typically what you would see, a narrowed pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. So 120 over 80, that's the pulse pressure. Basically it's a difference of 40. Um, so in the next time around, our patient with cardiac tamponade, maybe they're now 116 over 88, and the next time it might be uh, 108 over 90, and then we might have a 102 over 96. So that's the narrowing pulse pressure. Those numbers get closer and closer together because the heart has less and less ability to pump. We can also have aortic injuries, an aortic tear. Um, and the aorta are the largest blood vessel in the body, the highest pressure blood vessel in the body, and penetrating trauma can cause some direct damage. Uh, blunt trauma can sever or tear the aorta. The heart hangs from the aorta essentially by a little set of ligaments uh, that kind of suspend it so it kind of moves back and forth. Uh, and if a, you suddenly slam into something, your heart r comes forward, it can tear away from the aorta. And uh, damage can cause this high pressure bleeding which is often fatal. If you transect your aorta, transection means you completely separate it, uh, cut it in complete half essentially, uh, you will bleed to death within your chest within about 30 to 60 seconds. It takes less than a minute for you to bleed to death and pump out all of your blood volume into your chest.
When patients have an aortic injury, they'll typically complain of chest pain, abdominal pain, or back pain. Sometimes they'll say that it felt like it tore. They'll have signs of shock. And in many cases, we'll have differences between blood pressures in the right and the left arms. So if it's somebody you're not sure, they've had trauma, they're complaining of chest pain, looking a little shocky, you might want to get a blood pressure in both arms. And uh, you can have a significant blood pressure. Usually the blood pressure in the left arm will be lower than that of the right arm. Commotio cordis. This is a fairly uncommon condition. When we do hear about it, it's usually on an on a, uh, athletic field. Uh, but uh, trauma to the chest uh, when the heart is in a vulnerable state. So the heart is, has the cycle that it goes through. And part of that cycle is a phase in which the heart cannot depolarize. Um, it, it's in a complete repolarization. Um, so it's not able to depolarize. Well, if you are hit at just the wrong spot in that cycle, it depolarizes the heart when it can't be depolarized. And so therefore, it completely knocks down all the blocks. And uh, the heart just it doesn't know what to do, kind of spasms. So it goes into V-fib. We're going to treat it just like any other cardiac arrest patient. Um, we're going to do our CPR. We're going to defibrillate. A lot of times, taking a, uh, you know, a, a pitcher, taking a line drive back to the chest off the bat, um, sometimes getting hit directly in the chest from certain types of contact sports. Um, for some reason, when we were in uh, junior high, we used to think it was cool to walk around and punch our buddy in the heart. Um, you know, right in the middle of the chest, and uh, not, not really sure why we thought that was cool, but uh, come to find out that uh, it was cool in other places too, and it actually would kill people uh, by getting struck in the chest at just the, the wrong time in the cycle. Uh, there's a video on the open pneumo and the hemothorax, I'm watching the other version of the PowerPoint. Abdominal injuries, these can be either open or closed. The internal bleeding can be very severe if the organs of the blood vessels are lacerated or ruptured. Remember when we talked about some of the abdominal emergencies, we talked that there are some hollow organs and there are some solid organs. Solid organs tend to be very blood vessel rich. Hollow organs tend to be filled with nasty acids and chemicals. So either way, you have the potential for there to be some ugliness in there. Uh, they are serious. They're painful. Uh, and evisceration can occur, and an abdominal evisceration is when you actually uh, lose the content uh, that should be within your abdomen, um, and uh, it comes out through the abdominal wall. They tried to demonstrate uh, an abdominal evisceration here. Uh, you can also see another uh, minor evisceration, uh, a couple of them, I guess, so one minor and one not so minor. Uh, on page 689 in your textbook, it's when uh, you get loops of bowel usually that have come out through the abdominal wall. So, so our assessment of them, again, just like in medical emergencies, it's so very difficult to tell what's damaged and what's in, in trouble. So a lot of times they get grouped together. Uh, the pain uh, is initially mild, but rapidly becomes intolerable uh, as the bleeding worsens. They'll usually have some nausea weakness and thirst. Uh, they can tell they're losing blood. Uh, the indications of blunt trauma to the chest, abdomen, or pelvis, we should be uh, you know, treat them all fairly uh, seriously. Uh, coughing up or vomiting blood in rigid or distended abdomens. Treatment for these people are going to include carefully monitoring their airway for vomiting. Remember, if you disrupt that gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes it wants to get stuff out of there in a, in a hurry. So you could have a patient that's vomiting quickly. So if we have a patient on a backboard that is going to vomit, we make sure that they're well secured on the backboard. So when we tip them up, they can vomit. Uh, uh, we can tip them up. They're stable on the backboard, and they can vomit. Uh, put the patient on their back with their knees flexed to reduce that tension on those abdominal muscles. We talked about that in abdominal emergencies or medical abdominal emergencies. Uh, by flexing the knees, you take the pressure off the abdomen. Uh, oxygen as necessary and treat for shock. If allowed, utilize the PASG. 
give them nothing by mouth because they're probably going to go see a surgeon. You give them anything via mouth, then they run the high risk of vomiting. And then continuous monitoring. If we have an evisceration, do not touch or replace the eviscerated organs. You're going to take a, a sterile dressing, um, moisten it with sterile saline over the wound site. So don't pour the, the saline onto the wound. Um, you take your larger dressings off to the side, dump a little sterile saline on them, place them over the wound um, to keep them from sticking because we got this kind of papery-like material that's touching a mucous membrane. Um, chances are probably pretty good that it's going to want to try to leave stuff behind and dry things out. So with a larger evisceration, we need to make sure we maintain the warmth by playing, pl placing layers of bulky dressing over an occlusive dressing. So basically what we're saying here is we're going to take a sterile moistened dressing with sterile water, of course, sterile saline, place that on the wound, then place a, an occlusive layer such as a piece of, um, say, plastic wrap over the top of those dressings. And then we're going to take usually a folded up blanket and place that over the top of the uh, occlusive dressing. That helps keep it moist and helps keep it warm. Won't let it dry out. If we have an impaled object, do not remove it. Stabilize in place with the bulky dressings like we talked about in the previous chapter. Uh, and leave the patient's legs in the positions bound. If they're moving their legs, it can move that object, and moving the object can cause it to come into contact with other structures. And use your video on the liver injuries. So in review, um, open chest or abdominal wounds are considered to be one of the that penetrate not only the skin but the chest and abdominal wall to expose internal organs. Open chest and abdominal wounds are life-threatening. A flail chest is, is characterized by paradoxical motion. We're going to seal an open chest wound with an occlusive dressing taped on three sides. Closed chest wounds are very difficult to distinguish. A patient who collapses in cardiac arrest after force to the center of the chest should receive CPR and standard uh, AED. If a patient develops signs of a tension pneumothorax, arrange for an ALS intercept immediately. So the patient's short of breath and getting shocky, um, you basically need to have ALS. When solid abdominal organs are injured, there can be major bleeds, cause life-threatening hemorrhage. When hollow abdominal organs are injured, they spill their content, causing irritation. Blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, and compression are all mechanisms that can injure the chest or the abdomen. Open or closed pertains to the integrity of the wall of the chest or the abdomen. Seal open chest wounds to prevent air from entering. Closed chest and abdominal wounds bear a high risk for underlying organ system damage and internal bleeding. Use mechanism of injury and patient assessment to recognize the signs or symptoms of shock. So. Uh, again, we're, we're reliving, uh, relying uh, on uh, our assessment again, very important tool. Uh, EMTs need to learn the signs or symptoms and specific treatment procedures for the various chest and abdominal injuries. So questions for you to consider. Is the patient's breathing adequate? Is it inadequate? Is it absent? Is the patient displaying signs of shock? Is there an open wound to the chest that needs to be sealed? Is the patient displaying signs of tension pneumothorax? Is there an open wound to the abdomen that needs to be dressed and covered? So your critical thinking question is, you're caring for a patient who was shot in the chest with a nail gun. You applied an occlusive dressing around the wound. The patient is suddenly deteriorating, having extremely difficult breathing, and his color has worsened. His breath sounds have become almost totally absent on the side with the impaled nail. What complication might you suspect is causing his worsening condition, and how could this be corrected? Well, if we have applied an occlusive dressing around the wound, we want to make sure that there is ability for the air to escape. This guy is most likely developing a tension pneumothorax, uh, and so by releasing one of the corners of that occlusive dressing, or one of the sides of the occlusive dressing, we can allow some of that built-up pressure to escape.